Okay, so he could begin with three bows to the Buddha. One, two, three. And then I'll just do one time the salutation. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Hey, good morning, everybody. And today's date is, wow, it's October 1st. How did the summer go by so quickly? Spring and summer. Anyway, that's the way time flies. Okay, so we're continuing now with our reading of the Anguttara Nikaya, and we are in the Book of Fives. And today we come to Sutta number 30. And this is a rather strange Sutta in some respects. And so we'll look through, I'll point out the things that are rather peculiar about it. Okay, so we start off with a typical scene in the life of the Buddha where the Buddha is wandering on tour. In this case, it's in the Kosala country, together with a large community of monks. And then he reaches a Brahmin village of the Kosalans. Its name is Icha Nangala. And then he's living in a jungle thicket. And then the householders of this village here that Okay, they hear the reputation of the Buddha that the ascetic Gotama, who's known as the son of the Sakans, he's gone forth from the Sakan family, and now he is dwelling in our own, right outside our own village. And then they, amongst themselves, they share their knowledge about the reputation of this ascetic Gotama, and this is the stock formula for the virtues of the Buddha, that he's an arahant, one who is freed from all defilements, one who is sama sambuto, perfectly, completely enlightened, accomplished in true knowledge and conduct and so forth, one who has understood the nature of this world and who teaches it to others, who teaches a Dhamma that's good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the end, with the right meaning and phrasing, one who reveals the brahmacharya, the spiritual life that is perfectly complete and pure. And so it's good to see such holy ones, such worthy ones, such enlightened ones. So all of this seems perfectly fine, very, very typical, normal, when the Buddha is wandering on tour. And then the next morning, the, these Brahmin householders prepare various kinds of food and they come to the place where the Buddha is staying in order to make an offering. But this is where they come in a bit unusual way that when they arrive at this woodland thicket, they stand outside the entrance, making an uproar and a racket. And probably that is what is disturbing the Buddha. I mean, not that the Buddha has animosity in his mind, but it creates some kind of negative impression. And so the Buddha hears this because the proper way, the proper way when a group of householders is approaching the Buddha or going to a monastery, even today, is to go quietly. Um, of course, they could be speaking a little bit amongst themselves, but generally one will want to come in a kind of humble, subdued, quiet manner. But in the case of these householders, they come making a great, commotion, a lot of noise, probably chatting, and I, I, I don't know what they're saying, but it's a lot of noise. And so the Buddha, though the Buddha probably knows what is going on, <laughs> but <laughs> for rhetorical purposes, he asks his attendant, this time a monk named Nagita. So he says, who is making such an uproar and a racket? It seems like it's a group of fishermen at a hall of fish. 
I guess when fishermen are have thrown their nets out into the sea and then they've gotten a lot of fish and they're pulling it in and they're making a lot of noise saying, pull to the left, pull to the right. Don't let them get away. All of us together, pull together. So they're all making a lot of noise. And so Nakita explains, so the Buddha should have known this himself, that these are the Brahmin householders who have brought abundant food of various kinds. And they wish to make this offering to the Buddha, to you, the Buddha, and to the, to the monks. Okay, but now the Buddha makes a very strong statement, almost it seems denouncing these people who have come with good intentions maybe without the proper manner, but with good intentions to make an offering to him. So the Buddha says, let me never come upon fame and may fame never catch up with me. So here the Buddha is sort of denouncing or rejecting fame, even though the Buddha has become so famous in Northern India, so famous that wherever he goes, as we saw this report about him, has sort of preceded him on his wandering rounds, that he is known to be an arhat, perfectly enlightened, and so forth. Okay, but here the Buddha is saying, like, I don't want to be famous. I don't want to be, <laughs> I don't want to be well known. I don't want to be honored and esteemed. And then he says, continues, he says, one who does not gain at will without trouble or difficulty, the bliss of renunciation, the bliss of solitude, the bliss of peace, the bliss of enlightenment that I gain without trouble or difficulty. Somebody who doesn't gain this bliss of, renunci of renunciation and so forth might accept and here he calls it a vile pleasure, a slothful pleasure, the pleasure of gain, honor, and praise. Yeah, what exactly is meant by this bliss of renunciation, bliss of solitude, and so on? Yeah, the commentary doesn't comment on this, which is a bit unusual. Yeah, I would have expected to see some comment on it to explain what is meant. And so one might take this to be, let me get the poly in here. Does anybody know how do I increase the font size of this note? Sunday, you just, now you have it highlighted, just click on the, the triangle next to the scroll bar. If you go to the scroll bar, next to the scroll bar, there is a little triangle. Go further to the right. W within the note box itself? No, within the browser, within the, the application. Can you go to the, the scroll bar on the right? Okay, I see that, yeah. And then there is a triangle a little below. Click on that. I and then see. Change it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay, so the terms are nekama 
sukha. So sukha is happiness or pleasure or bliss. Nekama is renunciation. Paviveka is solitude or seclusion. Upasama is peace. And Sambodha is enlightenment. And so one could interpret this perhaps in different ways. Some might take it to be a reference to the jhanas. And the jhanas would work for renunciation, solitude, and peace, but not for enlightenment. So it might be referring to what is called the fruition attainment. The fruition attainment is a special meditative absorption, which comes as the fruit of the attainment of the different levels of realization. And in the case of the Buddha, it would be the fruit of Buddhahood, in fact, or the, the fruit of arhatship. Okay, is that Nagita? No, the Buddha's attendant Nagita urges the Buddha to accept, to sort of admit the people of Ichanangala to allow them to come to him and to accept to receive their offerings. And then he says that wherever the Blessed One will go, these Brahmin householders will move in the same direction. And he compares this that just like when rain is falling down the slope of a mountain, the rain will always flow, the water of the rain will always flow downhill. And so wherever the Buddha will go now, the Brahmin householders will move, will travel in the same direction. And what is the reason? Because of the Buddha's sila and panya, his good behavior and his wisdom. But the Buddha repeats the same thing again, let fame not come upon me, let fame not catch up with me. And then he denounces what he calls that vile pleasure, the slothful pleasure, the pleasure of gain, honor, and praise. And this kind of repudiation of gain, honor, and praise is one of the major themes in the Buddha's instructions, particularly to the monks, because sort of one of the traps of the monastic life, the renunciant life, is to be swept away, to be obsessed with, to be driven by the desire for gain, that means offerings, offerings of robes, dwelling place, delicious food, and so forth, and especially honor and fame and praise. And those are, in, in my opinion, those are particularly dangerous attractors, dangerous lures, even more so than sensual desire for a monastic. Because sensual desire is just titillation of the senses that gives a momentary pleasure. But this attachment to gain honor and praise sort of is what provokes the arising of the ego consciousness and strengthens the tenacity of the ego consciousness, the sense of ego upon the mind. Because we're always engaged in a kind of pros progress, a process a project of self-evaluation, of evaluating ourselves in relationships to in relationship to others, and trying to determine how popular we are with others. And so even today with Facebook, people pride themselves on how many friends they can attract on Facebook. So I think that there's a limit of <laughs> of five thousand. And so somebody who wants to boost their own personal standing on Facebook will keep on sort of reaching out to attract more and more people as friends and approving them as friends until they reach the limit of, of friends on Facebook. And if that's not enough, then there's another feature on Facebook called followers. And so you want to have not only many friends, but many followers. And probably the same <laughs> and if you're putting up videos on YouTube, you want to get many likes and to have many people following you. 
if you have a YouTube channel. And so even back in the Buddha's time, this was one of the, I call it the traps in which a, a, a monk can fall is to be sort of swept away <coughs> by offerings, by honor, by fame, and by praise. And so in the Sangyutta Nikaya, the Buddha has included a whole chapter on the topic of gain, honor, and praise. And I just want to do a brief overview of some of the suttas in that chapter. So here the Buddha begins, he says that gain, honor, and praise are dreadful, that they're vile, and that they're obstructions to achieving the final goal. And then he uses some similes. He says, it's like a fisherman would cast a baited hook into a lake and then a fish on the lookout for food would swallow it. And so the fish swallows the fisherman's hook and then the fisherman pulls the fish onto the land and the fish meets with disaster and with death. And so the Buddha says that the baited hook is a designation for gain, honor, and praise. And a monk who is, becomes attached to gain, honor, and praise is just like the fish that has swallowed the baited hook. Somebody is going to meet with calamity and disaster. Okay, then there's another sutta called the turtle. Uh, this is a, a partly humorous one. Okay, so the Buddha says that one time in the past, there was a large family of turtles that had been living in a certain lake. And then one turtle said to the little turtle, the adult turtle says to the little tur turtle, don't go to such and such a region, such and such a part of a lake. But the little turtle goes to that region, and then the hunter strikes the little turtle with a harpoon. Mm. And then the little turtle turns to the first turtle, or, or the, the little turtle returns to the first turtle, to the adult turtle. And when the adult turtle sees the little one coming in the distance, he says, I hope you didn't go to that region. And the little turtle says, well, I didn't follow your instructions. I did go to that region. Um, then the adult turtle says, well, I hope you haven't been hit, hit or struck, dear one. And then the little one says, I wasn't hit or struck, but there is this cord constantly following me wherever I go. And then the adult turtle says, indeed, you've been hit, little one. Indeed, you've been struck. Now you have met with calamity and disaster, and you are no longer one of us. You're lost. And so the Buddha compares this to the monk who has become sort of attracted to and obsessed with gain, honor, and praise. And there's another sutta in this collection, which also has a very pic pict uh, picturesque simile. So the text says, suppose there is a beetle, a dung beetle, which is stuffed with dung. And in front of that dung beetle, there's a large dung hill. And because of that dung hill, the dung beetle despises the other beetles saying, I am a dung eater, stuffed with dung, full of dung. And in front of me, there is a large dung hill. And so the Buddha says that we have a monk who is obsessed with gain, honor, and praise, who extols himself and disparages the other monks who don't receive that gain, honor, and praise. 
that monk is like the dung dung beetle that's proud of its hill of dung and then despises the other beetles because they don't have a hill of dung. Okay, so with this, the Buddha underscores sort of the danger, the drawback of gain, honor, and praise. And then the Buddha is going to enter now upon the main sort of topic of the sutta. And these are the five items which are responsible for the inclusion of the sutta in the collection of the fives. So these are kind of five themes for reflection, one might, one might say. And the way I see it, all of these themes are inclining the mind in the direction of renunciation. So I say that these are five themes for reflection that incline the mind towards renunciation maybe that lead the mind towards that bliss of renunciation, bliss of solitude, bliss of peace, bliss of enlightenment. Okay, so the first of these is a reflection that whatever is one eats, drinks, and consumes, eventually winds up as feces and urine. That is its outcome. And perhaps the Buddha begins with this theme because the, the householders of each Anangala have come bringing probably many dishes of finely prepared delicious food, which they want to offer to the Buddha and the Sangha. And here the Buddha offers this theme for reflection as a way of turning the mind away from the obsession with delicious food. And one could use this little statement here as a theme for reflection in order to develop. This is one of the 40 topics of meditation mentioned in the Visuddhi Magga, the perception of the repulsiveness in food. Ahare pati, ahare pati kula sanya. And particularly for, for mon <laughs> I have to say for monastics, because we don't have easy access to the other types of sensual pleasure. And so because the mind is naturally inclined to seek sensual pleasure, so the mind will then fasten upon the food that one receives at the daily meal offering. And because people want to gain merit by offering del delicious food, they will prepare very, very sumptuous food to offer to monastics. Often that's the case. And so some monks can become very obsessed with delicious and tasty and beautifully prepared food. And so the Buddha teaches this theme that whatever you eat, whatever you swallow, whatever you consume, whatever you drink, eventually it's going to wind up with the same fate as all the other food that you eat. It eventually turns into feces and urine. What I find to be an interesting way to develop this theme of reflection don't just consider the food immediately in front of you, but think of all of the food that you've ever eaten in the course of your life, from the time you were a little baby drinking mother's milk, all the way through your childhood, adolescence, your youth, if you're beyond the youth, your middle age, right into the present day. All of the most delicious food, maybe you can consider all the varieties of food you might have eaten going to different restaurants, maybe Chinese food, Indian food, Burger Kings, pizza, steak, chicken, fish, um, dal curries, okay, Mexican food, Spanish food, Japanese food, Italian food, 
with all of its varieties, everything that you've ever eaten in the course of your life. And imagine all of those dishes spread out in front of you. So you look straight out in front of you and almost to the horizon, you see all of these dishes laid out in front of you. So that is all that you've eaten. And then you consider the destiny of all of that food, what has been the outcome of it. And it's all turned into feces and urine. And if you have, please don't, don't close down your Zoom link now when I say what's coming up next. But you consider the outcome of all of that food you've ever eaten in the course of your life behind you or beneath you, the buckets and buckets and buckets of feces and urine, which has been the destiny of all of that food. And when you reflect in that way, then it brings about a kind of disenchantment, disillusionment with the attraction to tasty food, where it causes the attachment, the attraction to delicious food to dwindle away. And it brings a kind of indifference towards delicious food. So whatever you eat, whatever you're going to drink, you know that it's going to wind up eventually as feces in urine. And you can develop this reflection on the repulsiveness of food in stages. So this is only taking the beginning stage and the last stage. But if you want to sort of reinforce this reflection, you consider you take the delicious food, you have several um, servings in front of you, whatever your favorite dishes are, you take some spoons of it, you put it in your mouth and you chew it, you chew it. And then you consider the morsel of food that's now been chewed in your mouth. And if you were to take a clean dish, even a dish of silver, and you spit out that mouthful of, of food, that delicious food, you spit it out onto the clean dish. And then somebody says, why don't you take it back into your mouth and swallow it? You don't want to do that. And so with that, you can get a perception of the repulsive nature of food. Okay, then you can consider the next stage. You, you've taken the spoonful of food, you've chewed it. Now you swallow it and it's common to the stomach. Then consider what the food is like in the stomach. Then you consider when the food passes from the stomach into the small intestines, then into the large intestines, what it's like. And then finally, when the residue passes out from the large intestines, it comes out as feces and the liquid that's been absorbed, it comes out as urine. So when you reflect in this way, then it causes the mind to turn away from its attachment to delicious food and the sense of dispassion or disenchantment, disillusionment, dispassion sets in. Okay, so that is the first theme for reflection, to engender a kind of disillusionment or disenchantment with delicious food. Okay, the second theme, from the change and alteration of things that are dear, maybe particularly we could say from the parting and separation from those who are dear and beloved, there arise sorrow, lamentation, pain, dejection, and anguish or misery. And so maybe the purpose of this reflection is to engender a kind of, maybe to soften the impact of separation from those who are dear. So when we reflect often in this way, then when we lose our loved ones, either through death or if they depart from us by leaving us behind, maybe to travel overseas, 
or if you have love, a man has a love for a woman and she rejects him, or the woman has a love for a man and he rejects her. So normally there will arise pain and dejection and misery. But if you reflect in this way, then you develop a kind of distance from those things that are and people who are dear and beloved. So when separation takes place, then the impact will not be as harsh, as severe, as cutting as it would have been if you hadn't done this reflection. Or as it would be if you ha have done this reflection. You know, one thing I want to say that there's a common attitude amongst Buddhists that when you lose a loved one, when a loved one dies, could be husband, wife, parent, child, or dear friend, that you should be able to endure it, to bear it with complete equanimity, with a completely unruffled mind. But in my view, this is not a healthy approach. What I say is that when you lose a loved one, one who's been very close to you, it's natural and normal to feel sorrow and grief. And so I say, let yourself feel that sorrow and grief. Let it arise in the mind. Don't try to suppress it. Don't think that you have to follow some kind of ideal of kind of stone equanimity, stone-like equanimity, that you remain completely unperturbed, um, unshaken. You let yourself feel the sorrow, feel the grief, but do so with mindfulness so that you're aware that you are experiencing this sorrow and grief. And you do so with what I call the wisdom of impermanence, the understanding of impermanence. So you know that this loss of the loved one is just one more example of the truth, the hard fact of impermanence. And if you reflect on this theme, in fact, something like this is one of the five themes that the Buddha teaches for daily reflection by everybody, whether monk, nun, lay man or lay woman, Sabehi me piehi mana pehi nana bavo vina bavo bavisati. That from all that from all who are dear and beloved to myself, there must be parting and separation. So either they will pass away while I continue to live, or I will fall ill gravely ill, fatally ill, and pass away, leaving them behind. So if you reflect on this regularly, then when the parting and separation takes place, it doesn't mean that there won't be sorrow and grief, but the sorrow and grief won't persist and obsess the mind. You'll be able to experience it sort of deeply, intensely, when the time comes, you'll be able to overcome it, to let go of that sorrow and grief and come back to a position of acceptance, to a state of acceptance. Whereas somebody who doesn't have this sort of this guideline of the Dharma, when they lose a loved one, they just remain, first they're overwhelmed and crushed, completely crushed at the time when the separation takes place. And then they can never overcome their sorrow and grief. But it just persists and continues to obsess the mind so that they lose all interest in living, um, all desire to engage in any other kind of projects, to form relationships with other people. All of that gets lost. But if you reflect on this theme, then you can accept the loss, experience the pain and sorrow, and then emerge from it stronger, wiser, with greater courage, patience, and equanimity. 
Okay, so this is that second theme for reflection. Then the third theme for reflection. And it's interesting, it seems, I just noticed that there seems to be a kind of sequence in these themes moving from normal, we might call normal life to deeper levels of insight and eventually to panya or liberating wisdom. Okay, so the third theme for one devoted to practicing meditation on the mark of unattractiveness, revulsion towards the mark of the beautiful becomes established. That is its outcome. And so let's look at some of the The, the ideas that are being suggested here, that are being conveyed. Let me put the poly in here. Okay, so first let's take this expression, the mark of the beautiful. And in Pali, this is Subha Nimitta. And this refers specifically to what I would call the attractive appearance of the body, the beautiful appearance of the body, which serves as the stimulus for the arising of sensual desire, sensual lust. So in the Book of Ones, at the very beginning of the Anguttara Nikaya, the Buddha says that the chief trigger for the arising of sensual desire, Kama Chanda, is the mark of the beautiful, the appearance of the beautiful in regard to the body. And so, we look at the body of another person, and usually this will be like the man looks at a beautiful woman, the woman looks at the handsome man, or for those of homosexual orientation, they look at the member of the same sex with a very beautiful body. And it's that appearance of beauty, nice hair, smiling face, bright expression in the eyes, nice breast belly, legs, feet, arms, hands, and the mind sort of fixes upon, focuses upon those, the general beautiful appearance and then the specific beautiful and attractive features. And based on that fixation on the attractive features, sensual desire arises. I must possess that body, enjoy that body. And for the person who's, especially one who's adopted the life of renunciation, then that becomes a major hindrance, a blockage on the path to mental development, especially to development of samadhi, concentration, and panya, wisdom or insight. And so how does one weaken and dispel the sensual desire. To do that, the antidote that the Buddha proposes is to turn the mind away from this mark of the beautiful, from the appearance, the beautiful and attractive appearance of the body, and instead to focus on the inherently unattractive or unbeautiful features of the body. And in the meditative process, the standard way this is expounded is by the meditation on the 32 constituents of the body. We did this practice 
um, over the Labor Day weekend when we had the four-day mindfulness of the body retreat. So in this practice, what we do is run through the constituents of the body in terms of 32 constituents, the solid parts beginning with hairs of the head, the bodily hairs, the fingernails, the teeth, and the skin. So if you lay out, you cut off some hair, put it out on a table. We have a platter put out on the table. We have a beautiful, maybe a beautiful model, Victoria's Secret model in front of us. So she cuts off some clip of her hair, puts it out on the table. Okay, and then we have the attractive man. He might shave some of his whiskers off, put them out on the table. Then we clip the fingernails, put them on the table. <laughs> we get a dentist to draw out our teeth, put the teeth out on the table, peel off some skin, put it out on the table. So there we have hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, skin. Nothing very beautiful and attractive there. Okay, And then one works inwardly, beneath, going beneath the skin to the flesh or the muscles, the sinews, the bones, the bone marrow, then taking the organs, kidney, heart, liver, diaphragm, spleen, and lungs, then the intestines, large intestine, small intestine, stomach, the fecal matter, the brains, and then the bodily fluids. And we we mentally visual, visualize them and focus upon them and observe, sort of isolate them and contemplate each one individually. And we see that it's not so attractive, not so beautiful. Then we put them all together to form this beautiful body. And we see that beneath the superficial appearance, there is the mark of the unattractive. And when that, when the mark of the unattractive appears, then the mind turns away from the beautiful appearance and becomes established in this turning away, this renunciation, this re re revulsion towards the beautiful appearance. Okay, so that is the third theme for reflection. Okay, then next we have And now we go to a deeper level. Now we come to the level of what I would call real insight meditation. For one who dwells contemplating impermanence in the six bases for contact, revulsion towards contact becomes established. That is the outcome. Okay, so first, what is meant by the six basis for contact in the Pali expression. Let me type that in. Type that in. Pas ayatana. So the base is ayatana and contact is pasa. So the word pasa originally means touch, but it's referring not to a physical bodily touch, but to the mental touch, the touching of the mind with the object. And that takes place, the contact <clears throat> takes place through six internal bases in relation to six external bases. So we have the six internal bases of contact and the six external bases of contact. So the internal bases for contact are the eye, ear, nose, tongue, then the probably the skin, or the area of the body, wherever there is the capacity for the touch sensation, 
And then the mind is an internal organ which can observe or contemplate or reflect upon ideas and thoughts. So we have the six internal bases for contact and they each have their corresponding object, which are the external bases for contact. For the eye, there's visible forms. For the ear, there's sounds. Then there's odors, flavors or tastes, textures, the external object of touch. And then there are ideas or mental objects, the objects of the mind faculty. Now those sense bases themselves are all impermanent and therefore the object, the contact that takes place based on those sense bases is also necessarily impermanent. Yeah, there was a sutta there that I wanted to bring up in this relation to this. Yeah, the sutta is in the Sangyutta Nikaya, chapter 35, number 93. Let me bring up that sutta. So I'm going to reshare the screen. Do you see this, this sutta called the dyad? Yes, Bande. Okay. Yes. Okay, so this sutta, the Buddha is explaining how consciousness arises based on a dyad. A dyad means a set of two things. Okay, so how does it come about? So in dependence on the I and forms, there arises I consciousness. Now the I is impermanent, changing, always becoming different. And visible forms are impermanent, changing always becoming different. Yeah, so we always think that with our sort of ordinary perception that our I is something that remains constant, um, that we have the same I, of course, it will go through some development from ch infancy through childhood, through our adult years to old age. Maybe the vision will deteriorate over time, but we take the I to be something which is sort of lasting and stable. But from the Buddha's perspective, the I is a process, a process of events at sort of the microscopic level or the atomic level, always arising and passing away. But the I, the features of the I have the same function, the function or the capacity, the ability to see forms to, or to register forms. And then the objects of the eye, in this case, visible forms. So I look, for example, at this cup that I'm holding and the cup appears, at least by way of the color and shape, to be stable, lasting, enduring, substantial. But from the Buddhist perspective, that visible form, the form of the cup is always changing, becoming otherwise from moment to moment. It's not stable and lasting, but it's a process of momentary flashes of color and shape succeeding each other with extreme rapidity so rapidly that the different flashes of color and shape are fused together to give the appearance of a stable, lasting object. And so the Buddha says that this dyad is moving and tottering. That is, it's always sort of falling away and collapsing. 
is impermanent, changing, never remaining the same. And so the I consciousness, which arises based on this dyad, is always impermanent, changing, becoming otherwise. Okay, then he says, the meeting, the encounter, the concurrence, actually really just three terms, three words with the same meaning. So the meeting of these three things is called eye contact. <clears throat> that is the contact is the meeting of the eye, the organ or faculty, the object, in this case, the visible form with consciousness, eye consciousness. So when the consciousness meets the visible form through the eye is the faculty or the organ, that is contact. And contact is arising on the basis of things that are impermanent, always changing. And so eye contact too is impermanent, changing, becoming otherwise. And then the same applies to based on the eye contact, there arises feeling, intention or volition and perception. And those are also moving, tottering, impermanent, changing, becoming otherwise. So from the Buddha's perspective of this deep insight, this world that seems to be made up of stable, persistent, lasting, enduring objects, is actually a flux or process of events that are just flashing into being and vanishing at incredible speed. Okay, let me go back to the sutta. Yeah, and so normally we don't see this impermanence of the six sense bases and the impermanence of contact because our minds are not trained sufficiently. And so we get sort of sucked in by the appearance of stability, of lastingness in things. But through the development, the systematic development of mindfulness and insight, usually we could begin with the mindfulness of the body attending to the different sensations in the body and seeing how all of those sensations are just arising and vanishing one after another at subtler and subtler levels. So when you get to the deepest level, it just seems like you're down to the quantum level where things are just flashing in, in and out of being thousands of times in the snap of a finger. And so when I'm seeing the impermanence in the six bases for contact. And with that revulsion or disenchantment towards contact becomes established. So that is the outcome. Okay, so this will be a reflection leading to insight based on the six sense bases. Then we have number five, will be another contemplation leading to insight based upon the five aggregates. So in this case, the text says, for one who dwells contemplating rise and fall in the five aggregates subject to clinging, revulsion towards clinging becomes established. That is the outcome. So I find this a little bit puzzling. What I would say, <laughs> my own revision of the sutta would be for one who dwells contemplating rise and fall in the five aggregates subject to clinging, revulsion towards the five aggregates becomes established. Okay, so we know what the five aggregates are, or at least we should. So the five aggregates are the bodily form, feeling, perception or ideation, volitional activities and consciousness. 
And so in the course of the development of insight, one turns, once the mind becomes somewhat stable, steady, and well-focused through some meditation subject that, that serves to calm the mind, one then turns to observe the process of the five aggregates themselves. And usually for most, most practitioners, one begins with the rupa kanda, the aggregate of bodily form. And so one will observe the bodily form, maybe the way we did on the retreat, the mindfulness of the body retreat. One will scan the body moving from head to down to the feet, scanning the body over and over. And as one does so, as the mind gains in strength, intensity, power of concentration, one starts to see the changing nature of the material phenomena that constitute the body. One starts to see how all of these material phenomena are constantly rising, that's coming into being, and then almost immediately passing away, vanishing, disappearing, undergoing cessation. And so one focuses on the arising and passing away of material form, then once the observation of arising and passing in the material form of the body becomes well-established, then one will turn to the mental aggregates one turns to the arising and passing away of feelings. So one sees that every feeling, whether the feeling is pleasant, painful, neutral feeling, is subject to arise and pass away. Even something like if you're doing long periods of sitting meditation, there will arise a pain, maybe pain in the legs, pain in the back, pain in the pelvic region, and initially one becomes sort of repelled by that pain and feels aversion towards it. But if you just go on observing the pain, you start to see that what you have labeled as a painful feeling, a pain, as a kind of solid painful feeling is actually made up of moments, occasions of painful feeling, which are arising and passing in very rapid succession. And so that can become a very interesting, <laughs> interesting object of observation that the pain is made up of moments or occasions of painful feeling. And so instead of being repelled by the pain, you just become fascinated by observing how these moments of pain are just arising and passing and how each one is a little bit different from the one before the one after. And yet they're all sort of apparently joined together to make up this monolithic, what seems to be a monolithic sensation of pain. And so one turns to the contemplation of feeling, then one turns to the impermanence, the rise and fall and the aggregate of perception, which in the meditative process will be observing the changing ideas, how ideas arise and fall away or observations arise and fall away, then to the arising and vanishing of volitions, one's intentions, one's purposes, even the intention, keep the mind on the object, keep observing, keep observing, that is volition. And so one could put that volition under the spotlight and observe how that volition is always, or what we call that volition is made up of moments of volition, moments of intention, each one arising and vanishing. And then behind the entire process of contemplation is the aggregate of consciousness. And one sees that consciousness itself is just a succession of moments of consciousness. If there's seeing, it will be a moment, an occasion of eye consciousness, hearing, an occasion of ear consciousness, smelling, tasting, touching occasions of touch consciousness. And when thinking, observing, meditating, occasions of mind consciousness. And so one is observing 
the arising and passing away in these five aggregates subject to clinging. And with this, what I would say is that this enchantment or revulsion sets in towards the five aggregates and towards the clinging based on the five aggregates, particularly the clinging to the notion of the self or the I rooted in the five aggregates. So one sees that this notion of I, the notion of self to which we cling as our the, the expression of our personal identity, that that sense of I, sense of self is just a perception, a notion, an idea based upon and ascribed to these five aggregates, which are constantly arising and falling away. And so with that, a turning away from clinging and particularly the clinging to the notion of I, mine, and self becomes established. Okay, perhaps that should serve for our exposition of the sutta. Now we can see whether we have it, people have any questions. And the way to pose the question is by clicking the raise hand symbol. So I already see Miriam. You. Yes, Bhante. Thank you. Um, I really enjoyed what you were just talking about. I'm just fascinating. Uh, I remember the cause and effect that you taught us a while ago. And I'm trying to put that into the practice in terms of like, when feeling arises, when contact arises. Mm -hmm. And then when something that is usually unpleasant and I'm trying to deal with it, mm. I try to tell myself that you are fabricating with ignorance since this mm. is the root of the suffering and the stress. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to make sure the method that I started it is that the, am I on the right track of this uh, mantling, this obsession with anger or when I get angry, when I get upset, when something is not to my liking, um, not to attach to it, not to build on it, not to add to it. Is that the right way of um, dealing with uh, Distangling the dependent co arising, basically. Yeah, actually, there are sort of like many different methods that one could use. That that is sort of like one method. Okay. Um, say, say if anger arises towards a, to, well, anger can arise either towards other people or towards circumstances and conditions. And so, if, uh, if anger arises persistently towards people, then like one way to gradually build up the force in the mind to remove the anger is through the development or practice of metta bhavana, the development of loving kindness. But there are like other ways as well. And that is, I, I, actually, I think I should save an explanation of how to deal with anger for some a later sutta. But just to say that there's many different methods of dealing with anger, whether it's in relation to people or in relation to circumstances and things. But we'll come to those maybe with a later sutta. Okay, but the way I'm talking to myself in terms of, okay, you're fabricating with ignorance, Mariam, stop it. It's just anger, it's just a feeling, it's impermanent and it yeah, goes away. Yeah that's, yeah, that's a good way. Okay. Whatever you find effective, you just continue with that. Okay. Okay, Thank next you. is Yudi. Yes, good morning, Bante. Good morning. So for uh, number uh, number four, contemplating uh, impermanence, I'm a little confused. So it's, it's um, the sixth base, uh, basis for contact. Did yeah. you say it was internal or the external sixth base for contact? Like, is this like something like cognition uh, that he's referring here? I think it's probably pre predominantly 
the impermanence of the six internal bases for contact. Okay. So I have to say that to really to contemplate impermanence in contact, or, or it's actually in the six, yeah, in the six bases for contact. To contemplate impermanent in the six bases, I, I find very, very difficult myself. I find yeah. it easier, easier to do the impermanence of the object. Okay. Yeah, but especially, this... especially what I find useful for getting the sense of impermanence would be turning the attention to sound. This is when you're doing sitting meditation, a, a kind of practice that's taught by some teachers. Okay. Yeah, just open the air faculty. Okay, I, I understand. I get yeah. it now. Okay, yeah. thank you, Bhante. Yeah. Okay, next is Young. Good morning, Bhante. Can you hear me? Yeah, I could hear it very clearly. Thank you, Bhante. Um, from reading the suttas, it seems like the arising and passing away are dependent on other conditions. So the the momentary arising and passing away by, by themselves, I'm wondering if this is many a uh, Abhidhamma concept or is it also from Sutta? No, I think it's also, I'd say it underlies the suttas as well, that things just arise and fall away. It's the inherent nature of things to arise and fall away. What the Abhidharma has done maybe is to take the concept of impermanence and then cast it in the framework of momentary units of consciousness so that there are distinct units of consciousness or acts of consciousness, which each has a beginning, a fixed beginning and end. But I say from the Sutta perspective, the all, all of the phenomena are just inherently undergoing arising and passing away. Okay, thank you so much, Bhante. Yeah, there's a verse that we often chant. Let's see. Anicca vata sankara, anicca vata sankara, upada vaya damino, upajitva nirujanti, te sangvupasamo sukho. Impermanent are all conditioned things. Upadavaya Damino. Their very nature is to arise and vanish. Having arisen, then they cease. Their subsiding is blissful or peaceful. Yeah, Thank so you, we Bhante. can see. Yeah. Okay, next is cat. You have to unmute. Okay. Hi, Bundy. Hi. Um, yes, I just want to ask you a question in regards to like this lecture and the previous lecture. Where can I like access to? Like I can't. Oh, can I, I see. I, oh, I, see. To it? I see. They go up. They they go up on the website. Oh, I'm sorry, the YouTube channel. It's called the Baus. It's B A U S, Zhuang Yan Monastery. YouTube channel, then on the YouTube channel, there are various playlists. And there's a play, okay. a playlist for the numerical discourses or Anguttara Nikaya. Yeah, the one from the last one that I gave last week, uh, I just had put it up yesterday. I was oh, a bit, great. A bit lazy. Thank you, Bente. Okay. Thank you, Bente. Okay, Heinz. Yeah, good morning, Bente. Good morning. Um, how, how should we uh, understand the difference between revulsion which is a wholesome, um, you know, strategy to deal with uh, unwholesome objects and aversion as one of the yeah. three defilements. Um, we don't want to develop an aversion to the mark of beauty, we, we I, I assume. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. One doesn't want to develop a aversion in that sense. Yeah, th there are different words that are used in Pali and it's a, something of a problem to find English translations that can bring bring out the intended meaning without having undesired overtones. And I'm afraid re revulsion also has a negative overtone, but I, I just don't know a, a suit. Well, you use the term disenchantment, which, which um, seems um, in some ways to encompass it 
perhaps better because it presupposes there is enchantment with beauty and then you yeah you know. yeah yeah so in my translation i use this enchantment for another pali word which is nibida mm. and so i didn't want to use this enchantment here because then there would be in uh, it could be confusion between the two words mm. but i'd say that this revulsion it it suggests more obviously and clearly a turning away but mm. not an aversion in the sense of well actually the word aversion literally means turning away so in a way aversion would be a suitable word here except that aversion is sometimes used to render the pali word patiga which is a kind of forceful antagonism towards what is considered undesirable mm. Okay, well, thank you. Okay, I think we'll have to end our program for the day. Okay, so let us end then with the sharing of the merits. So I'll recite the verse. Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahitika punyantang anumoditva chirang rakantu sasanang. Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahidika punyantang anumoditva chirang rakantu deisanang. Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahidika punyantang anumoditva chirang rakantu mang parang. Dukha pata chani dukha baya pata chani baya. Soka patajani soka, unto sabe pipani no. May those in suffering be free from suffering. May those in fear be free from fear. May those in sorrow be free from sorrow. May all living beings also be thus. Thank you, 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 you, Thank 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 you, Great to see you, Bante. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, take care. Thank you. Bye, Bante.